Good morning and welcome to Pello Talk. I'm Dave Pello. This morning I'm very privileged to be sitting down in the dining room of Ron Boswell, former Senator for Australia, uh, a member of the National Party and represented Queensland as, as his electorate for more than three decades. Uh, former Senator Boswell is highly regarded and widely liked on both sides of the House as a uh, honourable man of integrity and uh, a genuine servant of, of the people. He's an elder statesman in Australian politics and uh, it's a great honour to, to be sitting with you this morning, uh, Ron. Not allowed to call you Senator anymore, but I really, really want to. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, yeah, in, agreeing to the interview. Yeah, it's a pleasure, Dave. Tell us, for those people who maybe are new to politics and, and weren't paying attention when you were, you know, in the parliament, tell us a bit about who you are, your early life, before you even got into politics. What was your career, your, your trade? Well, I was a manufacturer's agent uh, when Australia used to produce products uh, and make, and we made things and uh, had industry. I was a manufacturer's agent for a paintbrush company mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Tomlin's Garbage Bins and Buckets and Metalware. Okay. And uh, I, I developed that up. I, I started in 1966 and developed that up. Uh, the paintbrush agency was very low sales and I built that up to, uh, after about 18 years, to the leader of market leader in Queensland. And, wow. Wow. Um, and uh, good product, but uh, and we sold it well, and and uh, I had a very successful small business. It was a micro business that employed nine people. Okay, but it really stood me in good stead uh, in in Parliament because I knew what business had to do and what competition was all about, and uh, how small business had to survive. And this little business, it uh, indirectly. Not through me, but I knew that if I didn't sell my Queensland share of the market, there were 300 people back in the factory that wouldn't have a job. So I knew a lot of people relied on me for their for their livings. Okay, 300 people. There was about 300 people worked in the uh, in the. Well, there'd probably be more if you took Oldfields and Tomlins together. We a lot more, but wow. I had to I had to sell Queensland's proportion of the, the factory output, and I did that. You were the salesman for the state? Well, it was a bit more than that. I had a, fa I had a warehouse and um, three uh, storm and packers, mm -hmm. two girls on the uh, writing invoices and uh, 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 in doing the office work, and, uh, and uh, three salesmen, so, or two salesmen and myself. So yep. Uh, wow. So it uh, was only a little business, but it was a yeah. very profitable little business. It doesn't sound like a little business. It sounds oh, bigger, no, than, no. bigger than many. <laughs> it was a micro business, but many, many of Australia's small business are micro businesses, about 9, 10, 15 people. Mm. And um, when I went to Parliament, I understood, I understood what businesses needed and what they wanted, and I understood mm. the competition and... Um, and it was good. I can remember the, one of the last days in Parliament uh, in the party room. I said to them, I addressing the party room, I think it was on a farewell speech, and I said, guys, I'd probably be the only person in this party room that hasn't got a degree, but I'm only, probably the only one that's ever run their own business. And, yeah. and didn't go broke. I kept it going and until uh, uh, I got into Parliament. Uh, so I found that the most... Uh, important thing in mm. Parliament to know what small business was all about because everyone can talk about it yep. but very few people have had the experience. I was volunteering for one of the candidates in the recent Queensland election and was talking to the young man who'd been flown in from Canberra to, to volunteer for the Labor Party candidate. And he was a political student, just finished his second year in a, in a multidisciplined political degree at Canberra Uni. Mm. And he, I, I strongly encouraged him, if you want to pursue it, you will be groomed, you will be put through a, a career path um, by the unions and, and the Labor Party because he was definitely talented. 
I said, but resist them for at least five years, maybe 10, and live the real life. Outside of law, unions, and any political staffing position, run a business, work a hard job, work a, a very, you know, get in touch with the, the common people who, who don't have any kind of political, uh, you know, hobby. Um, well, unfortunately, just, that won't happen because what he will do will go from his... Um, political uh, from his university course, they'll maybe warehouse him in the, a big company like um, Telstra or something like that. Then he'll find his way into um, um, a ministerial office or a political office, and if he's any good, mm. and work the numbers on factions, he'll end up in a ministerial office. And then, if he's, uh, and he'd have to be aligned with a union somewhere. And once that happens, uh, He'll probably they will, the Labor Party will give him a seat either in the Senate mm. or the Parliament if he's got any talent. Yep. And uh, unfortunately, that's the representation coming from the Labor Party at the moment. You start at the university, you get a degree, and work your way through the system. Uh, when I first started in politics, there were actually a number of people in the Labor Party that actually were ex blue collar workers. Not many, but there were. There were a few. There was some. There was some. Uh, a doctor and a, um, uh, a number of people that had uh, some sort of degrees, uh, and they actually had done some work in business or industry or commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't happen anymore, and that's the very sad. Uh, very sad for the Labor Party. What and was the path for you from from profitable small business to politics? Well, what happened in the, in the National Party, I was the, in 1974, my wife, who had been a member of the country party since 1954, I think, mm -hmm. uh, decided that when the Whitlam uh, government came in, that uh, there was a big chisholm went down through Australia, you were either mm -hmm. on the left or the right. She decided that she was going to uh, uh -huh. uh, support the Conservatives, Doug Anthony, and uh, uh, so she manned a polling booth in Wynnum, a little tiny place outside, or Wynnum, outside of Brisbane. The consequence of that was I asked a friend of mine to run, who was a very successful person, but a very, had a lot of community involvement, and we won the seat by 39 votes. Wow. The, the first seat ever won by the National Party, or, or as it was then, the National Country Party. Mm -hmm. In, um, in, in the metropolitan area. That led me into some being accepted right at the hierarchy of the, at, as it was at the National Party with Joe and Bob Sparks. And uh, then when Florence Bielke Peterson ran for the Senate, we had a very strong membership and structure out of Brisbane, but very little in, within Brisbane. Mm -hmm. And I was able to assist them to man the polling booths right through Brisbane, which led to her um, getting into the Senate. And I spent then that I, I spent more and more time on politics and less and less on the business. And uh, I said to the Premier at the stage, I said, look, I'm, I can't keep going like this. I'm either going to have to get back into business or I'm going to have to get into politics. And he said, well, run for the Senate and see how you go. Yep. And that's what I did. I ran for the Senate. It was a double disillusion. I got number three on the ticket. Florence pulled enough vote to bring me in, and that's how I started. What year was that? Uh, 1983. 1983. Yeah. And you spent, was it 34 years? No, 31 and a half years. 31 and a half years yeah. well, that's not in the bad federal parliament. The average life of a parliamentarian is about seven and a half years. Yep. So that's... Uh, Congratulations. Well done. That was... Um, and there were some thrills and spills in that, and we um, had to. We had, well, we had a very big vote in the in the in the west of the range and in the rural and regional areas. We mm -hmm. didn't have much in Brisbane. Yep. And we had to pull together a, a composite of votes to make up to get the get the quota. And we were very successful in pulling the small business vote. Yeah. On trading hours and on. Uh, 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 the taxi vote. We united all those little mini businesses together and formed mm -hmm. a, and, and had enough to get over the line with the with the rural vote. 
Now, tell me about your reflections and memories on the merger between the Liberal Party and the National Party in Queensland. I've, I've heard it said in, in the media recently, uh, on commentary on the recent uh, Queensland election, that you were among a, a group of people, I think, including John Howard, who said that if the Liberal and National Party merges in Queensland, it will only create space for another minor party on well, the right. Well, that, that has happened, and, and that happened uh, at the last state election. Yes, John Howard and I and Barnaby Joyce, we opposed the merger for a number, of, but the main reason was that if you take a join, you merge the two parties, and then you will have another party coming up. And we saw two parties coming up last time, Catter and One Nation. Now, One Nation's been around for a while. It didn't do much good, won one seat. It managed to disrupt us, put the preferences back, and elect a Labor government. Mm. Now, to the Social Conservatives that voted for One Nation, it was the biggest act of self-harm I have ever seen. Yeah, I agree. Because the Labor Party are going to bring back abortion on demand. And it'll, be, it'll probably be the worst uh, abortion legislation in Australia. Yeah, with, without restraint, right up to birth. And mm. that is what you get when you voted for One Nation. I mean, sure, there's many other things. Tree clearing, that'll be stopped. Um, any advancing on agriculture, there'll be a number of things to stop. But to this, uh, to this audience here, the to the, the social conservatives that said, oh, I don't really want to vote for the Labor Party or, or, or for the National Liberal National Party. Well, what you've got is abortion on demand. Now, if that's not an own goal, I don't know what is. Yeah, it was, um, it was a, a, quite a betrayal of One Nation supporters for One Nation to direct preferences in such a way that delivered a Labor government. Yes. The Labor government was delivered by one nation. Labor now has a mandate. It can say honestly to the people, well, we won the election. Mm. We won the election. And without an upper house, they've uh, got a blank check to do so what they So we want. won the election. Mm. And where I live in this electorate here is Jackie Trad's electorate. And she sent me a number of notes to ask me to support her to vote for her in the letterbox. And she has said openly that one of her big uh, wins was making abortion more available. It's terrible. As an elder statesman of the Liberal National Party, what would be your advice now to the party's leaders and members about how to win the next election, quite honestly, and form government in, in 2020? Well, that's a, a hugely broad question. How, how would you do it? Whether you would do it as a combined party, which is an LNP, or a, a Liberal party and a National party working very strongly in coalition, in the it's it's difficult. The LNP meets a lot of requirements. It's more you need one secretariat, you need one group of people, you need one management committee, or all that's understood. But the, the parties' brands are not interchangeable. They're to totally different parties. The Liberal Party has its own philosophy. The National Party has its own philosophy. They are different. And um, that, that, is, that is a debate that really is going to have to take place, whether the parties are, go out as a coalition again. And there'll be a number of people that won't want to do it. But I think the debate's got to take place. The National Party is a more of a conservative, socially conservative party. It has um, it has a a thread running through it in the electorate, which is really is underpinned by primary industry. So, if the farmer or if a sugar grower uh, knows that he's got to depend on the guy in the sugar mill to produce his sugar, and the guy in the meatworks knows that he's got to depend on the grazer to supply the cattle is and the prices are right and the season's right and 
small business and everything's right, and uh, the small business gets a lift right across if agriculture is doing well. So there's a common thread running right through the National Party constituency that um, is uh, based on primary interest. So it binds, it binds everyone together. The, no, the blue collar worker knows that he's got to depend on the grazier. The grazier depend, knows that he's got to depend on the blue collar worker. Mm. And therefore, it has a thread running through it that can, pulls everyone together. Um, the, and the LNP, uh, it's a bit different. Uh, now, whether, whether that debate takes place, I think it's got to take place. But who knows who will win it. Would your advice be that it was a noble experiment, but the experiment has failed? Uh, I wouldn't. I, I, uh, I think a debate's got to take place. I mean, I think the debate is worth taking place, but it's got to be something like the uh, Czechoslovakian debate where they... Czechoslovakia said, well, I, as Czech land, we would be better off on our own. And Slovakia said, and they shook hands, and, and there was no animosity. There was no blood in the street. Mm. It was just they walked away. And I think there's something in that, especially for harnessing that protest vote, which is currently bleeding off to Labor through misdirected preferences. For well, people well, to be able to say, well, I don't like the Liberal Party, so I'm going to vote national instead. But they would still support a coalition government. Well, people, once you bring in one nation, you have a, a number of reactions. Mm. Firstly, the moderate liberals will not vote for any party that relies on one nation for assistance or preferences. And so your moderate liberals will vote Labor. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, the moderate liberals won't vote for the National Party. Yeah. But blue collar workers will. Right. So it works is, is work, if you can work it together and you don't have any fights and you can work as a coalition, the same as it happens in, Queen, uh, in Canberra. There's no one in Canberra ever thinks in the National Party they're going to have the Prime Ministership or they're going to be leader. Yeah. But they think because they've got a fair section of the coalition as a percentage of the coalition, they've got tremendous influence, and they have. Yeah, that's true. Now, you saw... On Saturday, Barnaby Joyce going out and getting, I think it was a 72 or 75%. I think it was uh, mid-60s at the no, end of the day. Were, no, that's, that's two-party preferred. It's a lot higher than that. Okay. Uh, there was a, a, a person that could talk to the electorate in the way they understood, yep. connect with a blue-collar worker, connect with a, the grazier, connect with a small business person. Yeah. And he pulled in a huge vote. And that's the same happened in the last election. Yeah. In 2016, Barnaby Joyce went out, campaigned. We never lost one seat. Yeah. And we won an extra seat from the Liberal Party. Tell me, what do you think the likelihood is that a strong Australian Conservatives Party could fill the role, in, at least in Queensland, that the Nationals used to? No, it won't fill the role. It'll be a pro it'll be a protest party. It'll be a party that won't ever achieve anything. The only way you ever achieve anything is in government. You can achieve something in government. Could they not form a coalition together, at least in no, Queensland? No. There's no way in the world you could form a coalition. Only two party the, the only coalition the National Party would form would be with the Liberal Party and vice versa. I mean the LNP and Australian no, Conservatives. No, no. 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 What do you base that upon? Because Corey Bernardi has a small section of a particular vote, mm. and they're very, very conservative. But it, only, it wouldn't represent a big proportion of the electorate. And the only way you can achieve anything is being in government. Mm -hmm. And Corey Bernardi's party, or One Nation, or... Cater for that matter, will never get into government. And, uh, and also, uh, in the case of last uh, election, the LNP was able to block the abortion in when it, the abortion yes. legislation when it came into the, the State House. Mm -hmm. 
I don't think it blocked it. I think the Labor Party could see they didn't have the numbers because the LNP were standing firm against it. Yeah. And they withdrew the legislation. To his credit, Tim Nichols did make uh, assurances that in that term and this term they would not support any change. Well, that's that right. And he, he honoured that commitment last mm. term. He blocked he blocked any uh, um, introduction of abortion legislation. Yep. So, but he only was able to do it because he had a number of people in the parliament. And the parliament was only two or three, two votes, three votes short of him having a majority. And when the Cadders supported him, that was the end of it. But you're not, that's not going to be a One Nation or a, or a um, Bernardi scenario. Mm. So yep. I, my advice to people, if they're concerned about it, the join the LNP or join the National or the Liberal Parties or whatever is there at the time, and it's the LNP at the moment, <coughs> and have an influence on the policies, have an influence on who gets in the party. Yep. The pre-selections. Have, a, have an influence on the pre-selections. Mm. And that is the way you will control, or not control, but that's why you will influence. Yeah, good word. The, the, the decision of what is happening in... Uh, uh, in Queensland or in Australia for that matter um, because you do it through your party branches and then your yeah. central councils and so forth actually directs the policy. Now, you had a little phrase in there that I want to pick up on and, and ask a further question on. You you said that the Australian Conservative Party is very, very conservative. Yeah. And you followed that up with their electorate or their constituency isn't very big. Um, well, it's a, it's a big constituent, but it's a small percentage. A small percentage, yeah. uh, sure. So given that reflection, I want you to comment on uh, significant LNP leaders like Tim Nichols and Graham Quirk. Well, I never comment on anyone. That's for someone else to well, do. Well, let me, let me talk about the party culture as opposed to the specifics, mm. but specifically exampled mm. in Graham Quirk and Tim Nichols. Uh, taking official public positions on behalf of the LNP uh, in favour of homosexual marriage and redefining marriage. Are they bringing the party to better represent a less conservative constituency or are they taking the party away from the effective base that that they're actually representing. Well, so. Barnaby, let me put it to you this way. Barnaby Joyce recently, very recently, said perhaps the worst criticism you could level at anybody in politics is unhelpful. Is Graham Quirk and Tim Nichols coming out in well, support of redefining I, marriage unhelpful? Oh, look, that's a very silly question. If you think I'm going to respond to uh, something like that, I mean... They, if you want, let me reflect this way, if you want to influence the, which way the party goes, join the party, have your votes, see who gets into the pre have an influence on who gets into pre-selection, yep. who gets pre-selected, and then that is something positive that you can do. The other way is just sitting, you're like the bird on the biscuit tin, you're on the outside influencing no one. I like that illustration. <laughs> Bird on a biscuit tin. Yeah. So is the party, the coalition, Liberal, National, Federally or, or in Australia, uh, drifting too far to the left? And is that, is that something the members can change or is that something the leaders can change? Well, the members of the party, the, 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 the members can change it. But just... You've got to assume this, that the National Party is more conservative. Uh, it reflects the values of the people. People in the rural Australia are more conservative, on, certainly on social values. People in the, in the metropolitan seats are very, very to the centre or to the left. So if you design a party that is just extremely conservative, it mm. won't work because you offend or you just drive off the the, the, the medium people, yep. the people in the middle of the road. So you've got to have a party that is influenced by the membership. 
And if people want to do something in the conservative in the conservative base, then I, my suggestion to them is join your local branch and have an influence. Because what you will do by joining a minor party is have a process which will be absolutely useless and never achieve anything. I, uh, I think that one's going to stick with us, a bird on a biscuit tin. Mm -mm. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's gold. <laughs> what do you, tell me about Pauline Hanson and One Nation. What are your thoughts on that? Well, in, in 2001, I think it was, uh, I ran against Pauline Hanson and it was a toe-to-toe -to -toe battle. And I actually said to my party, I would not run for them if they preferenced Pauline Hanson. Uh, and they selected me, put her near last on our Senate ticket, and we went to it. I won the, I won the, I won the election. Mm -hmm. she, I, she, I got into Parliament, she didn't. And I got in by exposing some of the, what I thought was bad, bad policy. Of? Pauline Hanson. It sounded terrific, but when you analysed it, it was a nonsense. Mm -hmm. Can you give us any, yeah. one example? Uh, yes, I can. There is a thing called Citizens Initiative Referendum, which virtually says that everyone, if you've got a, everyone gets a vote on, on a particular issue. Mm -hmm. They use it in America, uh, in California, they call it a proposition. So if you want to get something up, you have a referendum, you get a number of signatures, you get a referendum, and uh, that goes through the state house. It sounds terrific, everyone gets a vote. Mm -hmm. But what would it do to rural Australia, which is overwhelmed mm -hmm. by the cities, mm -hmm. overwhelmed by numbers in the cities? Yep. So what do you think would be first to go? Live cattle exports. That would be the first to go. Yep. And uh, so rural Australia, primary industry, rural Australia would be standing up and it'd have the vote west of the range. And down here, particularly these in these inner city suburbs, get up would just go hard at it. Yeah. And then you could take kangaroo culling, which yep. is absolutely necessary yep. out in the bush. But people here don't understand it yep. in the cities. And then you could have... Um, uh, euthanasia, things like that. Yeah. And that would be uh, just override the rights of everyone in, in regional Australia because the weight of numbers in the cities would override the net regional people in the regional Australia's wishes. Another one is too many politicians. Well, that's populist nonsense, particularly to the people in rural regional Australia. Mm -hmm. They know if they're going to get anything, it comes through their local member, their education, their schools, their roads, their hospitals. Mm -hmm. And where is there less, going to be less politicians where there's less people? Where is there less people? In regional Australia. Mm. Now, there's just two examples yep. of a really thoughts that have, will have no thought behind it, yep. but implement, if implemented would hit regional Australia really badly. But there's quite a number of others. It seems like, well, it is a black and white position that if we, pre if we swap preferences with One Nation, I won't stand for pre-selection. Is there no room at all for no. the pragmatic no, benefit yeah. to your election chances? No. It had two things happen. If you swap preferences, your moderate Liberal Party, your moderates, not your Conservatives, your moderates will go and vote Labor because they don't want any association mm. with a political party that has to rely on One Nation for support. Mm. So that doesn't seem very rational. It seems like out of the frying pan into the fire. No, no you, you're a Conservative. You don't think like them. <laughs> um, I'm telling you what is out there. Right. And I've seen it. Yep. I have seen it yeah. time and time and time again. And, um, and then, of course, you weaken your primary vote by your people going into voting One Nation. It pulls your vote down, pulls mm. the LNP vote down and reduces that and makes it very hard to win. It, but it, you could put up with that. 
if it had any if they had any substance, but they'd have absolutely no substance. Mm. If you ever go into their policies and expose their policies, as um, uh, as a number of people I have, but so. I don't see any value in one nation whatsoever. All that's ever done is put Labor into power. Put them into power in Western Australia, put them into power in Queensland. Uh, and it'll put them into power if, if the LNP, if the Liberal or the National Party have anything to do with them. It'll put them into power federally. But I noticed today... Interesting. They're, they're dynamite. Mm. Anytime anyone ever touches one nation, you bleed from the left and you bleed from the, bleed from the right. Do you think the LNP should be preferencing uh, federally or, or state-wise one nation above or beneath Labor? Beneath Labor. Beneath Labor. Mm. Because the moment you put them above Labor, that's what happens. Your Liberal Party... So from the bottom up, Greens, one bottom, nation, Labor. I put Greens last, mm -hmm. one nation last, second last, Labor. Okay. And if you don't do that... You will, you will send a message to the, the Liberal Party and you need every Liberal vote yep. and they just disappear. Now, Pauline Hanson, I've seen her working, working a room. She's a very genuine person, very good listener. Um, she, she comes across with people as not trying to push something but genuinely trying to represent them. Do you think it's that, or is there something else that makes her Look, I, get twenty percent of the vote? I think it is a protest vote. The people that don't want to vote Labor don't want to. Uh, I, I think the people she got a vote in Qu at Queensland, but mm. she got one seat. One seat. Yeah. What's she going to do with one seat? Yeah. Not a thing. But what she has done is given Labor victory. Yeah. Now, if anyone wants to touch her after that, good luck to them. I certainly don't. And she will do it every time. She did it in West Australia. Mm. Um, then she's done it in Queensland. She's done it in the Northern Territory. Yeah. What's the future for One Nation? How Look into your crystal ball for me and, and pre predict how long the party will survive, how long they'll consume I, I, the media's attention. I can't tell you how long One Nation will survive. I can tell you that... It's, I can tell you, by people voting One Nation, they got, or will get, abortion on demand in Queensland. Mm. So if you, you know, if that isn't a clear message, don't touch them, uh, I don't know what is, you yeah. know. Your only chance the conservative voice that, uh, has got is to control and get in and influence yeah. the, L, uh, the LNP or the National and Liberal parties. And... Um, then you will have a say in government and in opposition. But getting one member of parliament in is not going to achieve anything. Even when you wanted to block the legislation, uh, it took all, not, not most, but all of Nichols LNP, every member of parliament went in there, determined that they were going to block the uh, abortion legislation. Yes. No backsliders. They all were there. Mm. There were a couple of candidates in this last election which didn't get that message. The uh, the LNP candidate in Robbie Catter's new seat, uh, he he was on the record as saying "woman's body, woman's choice." Well, uh, but who? who uh, well, if, if if he said that. Uh, he didn't vote that way. He voted. No, he was just a candidate. He wasn't a member. He was. He was never elected. He was unsuccessful well, in this election. Oh well, you, that that's possible. But mm. uh, when it came to driving the policy, there was enough influential people in the Liberal National Party. Yeah. And through the party system, they took it to Nichols, and Nichols was influenced by the decision that was made by the Conservatives in the LNP. Yep. And he, and he agreed to block the abortion on demand, and he did. He did. And, yep. and, and if he had got into power uh, in this election, he would have made sure that it didn't, didn't happen, it didn't come up. I believe that, yeah. Um, he, he did good on that issue. Let's talk about 
the separation of church and state. Now I've explained to my viewers before that that's not actually a phrase that's in any legislation or constitution, either here or America. But there's, a, a I guess, a, a divide, a polarizing opinion, a polarized opinion on whether that means the government should be protected from religious influence or whether religion should be protected from government's influence. Uh, does the church need to be protected from government? What role do you see Christians generally having in the political debates and, and conversations in a nation? I think there is a room for Christians in politics, in the party structure, whether it be Labor or uh, National or Liberal. I think that's very really important. In fact, the Labor Party were actually founded well, when, when they were founded, or during the 30s, 40s, 50s, they had a very significant Catholic base, uh, which formed the Labor right. It's uh, not there so much anymore. Mm. But I think Christians should be members of all parties and influence, try and influence all parties. Uh, whether you have a... I'm not sure of your question, whether, you, whether the church can dictate to the... Uh, to the government, no, I wouldn't support that at all. Good, uh, I agree. I don't, I don't think that the church's role is to 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 um, tell a government what to do, but I think it can influence a government uh, by standing up on its own uh, its own values and policies. It can influence governments, but I wouldn't like to see a a, a, a political situation where churches had direct influence and could tell. Um, to tell the, the government what to do. Mm. Do you think there's any churches which are seeking that? Not to my knowledge. Yeah. It's a, it's a common fear, and I think it's a misunderstanding of, of less conservative people that... Uh, look, the phrase that I hear all the time is, don't impose your religion on me. Um, and when they're talking, especially in the recent marriage debate, it was a very common line that was thrown out there. <laughs> Um, but what it seemed they meant by that was that people with a religious worldview uh, should stay silent. Well, no, I, I, I don't agree with anyone. Should say. There was two strong campaigns, a yes campaign and a no campaign, and they went and tried and in, to influence the decision mm. of the government. Well, they didn't influence. They made the decision because... The conservative people wanted a plebiscite. Uh, we fought hard for a plebiscite, although it wasn't a plebiscite yeah. in actual fact. It was a, a vote. Mm -hmm. And um, the no side got done badly. Now, I don't know why that was, but certainly the people said that, you know, 38, 62 or whatever it was, mm. very disappointing to me because I campaigned for a no vote. Thank you. And, uh, uh, and I, I think a lot of people thought, oh, let's just get this off the agenda and voted to get rid of it. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, I think it's very hard to get a strong message out. Um, uh, um, Especially in just 90 days. Yes, and they've been campaigning for a long time. But mm. uh, anyhow, that's, uh, that's, how it, that's how it went. And uh, Reflect for me on the role that Christians and churches had in your career? Was it easy uh, being heard in, in Christian circles? Or? Yeah, yeah, I was. I, I, I made it a point, or I didn't make I had, a, I had a, a moral compass that I always went down a direction that my, the church, church is supported. I'm, uh, I consider myself a Christian. And uh, I, on any number of the boats, the boats like Euthanasia or um, RU486 and uh, Stem Cells, all those sorts of debates, I was I could always uh, mount a campaign and uh, uh, support the the direction of the, the, the what the churches were supporting. Right. So I didn't have any problems with the churches at all. Great. Did you? Um did you ever seek to increase the church's participation in, in those roles? 
in, in political, in having a political voice? Uh, I don't think I did. I mean, the legislation came through. There was a debate on it. Mm. Uh, pe there was a number of people coming through Parliament trying to influence people either way. A number of lobbyists, or uh, I put I put forward the arguments in the, in speeches, and uh, and I did everything I could to support the, the conservative cause on it. Are you are you generally happy with the level of participation? Of of Christians, it, it's quite often said that conservatives are hard to get organised. Well, when you look at the the organisation that the Green groups have got, and they have influence, people that vote for the Greens do have a lot of influence in politics and in Parliament. And yet, I would think there would be so many more Christians than sort of Green voters out there. No, mm. I don't think. I think the Conservative Christians could have a huge influence if they use their influence correctly and supported uh, one of the major parties. Not, right. not just the, not just the, not just your party. I know. I think if you're so far inclined to Labor, it, it, it's. I mean, I, certainly, I'd say you'd have more. Uh, I, I mean, it'd be better to influence or have influence in the LNP. But, you know, having influence in the Labor Party is important too. That's very impartial of you. Oh, well, I can see... You are retired from politics, I, aren't you? I can see the, uh, the the Labor Party had a number of people that voted, not many, but they had a number of people that voted against the yeah. um, same-sex marriage, half a dozen or so in the, in the Senate, I think. Mm. Mm. Uh, slightly related, but perhaps a little bit of a tangent question. Um, Senator, former Senator Joe Bullock, did he do the right thing or the wrong thing by quitting immediately? And well, I think he probably did the wrong thing because, uh, as it turned out, he, he quit. His, his reason for quitting was that he didn't want to vote for same-sex marriage, so he quit. Mm. But as it turned out, they had the Labor Party had a free vote on the on it anyhow, so he actually quit. Um, right. And he could have had the free vote because there was a free vote in, in the parliament last week. Yes. The leader of the coalition, the government, Malcolm Turnbull, um, established a precedent, you might say, uh, following in the footsteps of the Labor Party and justifying the overthrow of the sitting prime minister internally, according to the party rules, on the basis of consecutive poor performance in the polls. Um, this week he's had a, a bit of a bump in the preferred Prime Minister, um, increasing the gap between himself and, and Mr Shorten. But hypothetically, philosophically, do you think he's made his bed and he should lie in it? Or do you think, do you think the Liberal Party should now absolutely stop this culture of rot and division when in power, change leaders when in opposition, and let the fates decide on how they go at the next federal election? Well, what happened was there was a party room decision that changed the leadership uh, from Tony Abbott to Malcolm Turnbull. And there was a number of reasons for it, and I don't want to go into those. But to change the leadership again would just be totally unacceptable. You just couldn't change it back. You would the, the transitional damage would be too much. So you get in behind what the leader you got, and you work like crazy to keep him up there, because you know if you change again, you can't win an election. Yeah, well, and so that's. You just work as hard as you can to keep everything going as best you can. Was that your opinion the first time two years ago? I wasn't in the look. I don't want to. I wasn't in the. I wasn't in the parliament when the the um, when the uh, when it took place. And I think those things are better left with the party people in the party rooms that are actually. And the national party doesn't get a vote on the leadership of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much for your time uh, in your at your dining table today. It's, 
Thanks. And and thank you very much for your decades of, of public service to the state and the nation. It's uh, it's a great honour to have men of integrity and and consistency. And I hope that uh, the coalition and the LNP in particular continue to lean on your wisdom and experience uh, for their future. I think we've got a great man in the senator who now has your your Senate position for Queensland, Matt Canavan. Well, Matt. Matt replaced me, and there's uh, sometimes people say, "Oh, the guy that took over from me wasn't as good, and he didn't do, doesn't do this, and he doesn't do that." But I couldn't be happier with Matt. He's just done such such a wonderful job, mm. and uh, I just reflect every now and again, I did the right thing, getting out and letting someone like him come through. That's uh, a good feeling, isn't it? Yeah, it is a good feeling. It's a good feeling to know that you someone that replaced you is doing a, oh, I think, is doing an excellent job. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. That's it for this episode of Pello Talk. And if you'd like to subscribe to future updates or become a partner and help us make more episodes like this, bringing important conversations about public topics and, and policies to you, independent and free of mainstream media influence, please head to davepello.com where you can become a partner for a one-off donation or a small monthly amount, as little as $5. $3 a month if, if you prefer, any number that you like. But uh, it's really important to, to get this message out and to have keep the conversation going so that we can discover truth and promote good government and justice in Australia.